everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are live. We're live just about everywhere. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Creative Cloud on a Thursday. I'm going to be doing some photo editing tips and techniques and information to share. Uh, are you using classics, Classic or CC or both today? Today, I'm going to be using Lightroom Classic CC. Um, but I will make reference to Lightroom CC and let you know that you can do the same things in both. I'll also be doing some Photoshop. So without further ado, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me live here. And if you're watching the replay, thanks for watching the replay. We're going to be talking about uh, some, some photos that I took uh, a couple weeks ago when I was in Detroit for the Creative Jam. And I actually had a comment on the drone video on my YouTube channel. Someone, you know, a couple of people said, well, where can I see the photo? And I was like, well, it's on Instagram. And then they were like, well, are you going to show how you process the photo? And I'm like, great topic idea. So I turned that into a topic. So thanks for the suggestion, whoever said that. And uh, we're going to go ahead and dive right in. So let me go ahead and switch to my computer before I forget to do it. And I've got Lightroom uh, Classic CC open and ready to go. Thanks, Lloyd, Lloyd for the compliment. And uh, let's go ahead and fire up another stream here just in case. And also, let's start a recording. Hopefully, I won't start too many things and we break everything. All right, here we go. All right, we're up. We're ready. So, happy Thursday. So with that said, uh, I've got Lightroom Classic CC open. And while it looks like I've got nine photos showing, it's really 21. Hey, Bake Like a Pro, what's going on? I've got uh, some stacks. So you see the little numbers, the little number three on each or most of those. Those are stacks of three photos. And I usually like to shoot bracketed for HDR when I'm out, especially on location. And so that I know which ones are HDRs and which ones are panos and so forth and so on, I, I stack them together or group them into a stack, which is simply selecting two or more photos and either hitting Command G on your Mac or PC Control G. Or you can go up to, I'm sure it's in the menu here somewhere. I just never do it from the menu. There should be a group photos into stack. So under stacking, group, group into stack, and that's how you would do it. All right, some shout outs on Twitter here. Uh, who's that? Big Like a Pro. Uh, my three are my third eye. <laughs> welcome. And uh, welcome to all the folks on YouTube and Facebook. So, that was your first tip, just to, for organizational standpoint. If you've got three or more, or two or more photos that you plan on working with together, um, you can group them into a stack so that it will be easier to know which ones go with what, go with what process. The other thing is that you can also, when you're grouping into a stack, you can do it automatically. You can say auto stack by capture time. So if you got like, let's say you're looking at a collection of 100 photos, some of them were taken right, click, click, click right next to each other. Some were click, click, you know, several, you know, several seconds or minutes apart. You can specify the time of which um, to make smaller stacks or larger stacks based on how many seconds or uh, spacing between each photo. So that's uh, just a little bit of organization there, but let's go ahead and dive into the topic at hand. I've got three photos here from the lighthouse. These are the first three I'm gonna work on. We'll see how many we get through in this session, but uh, I just, you know, it, it depends on how much we do. So let's go ahead and select these three. And as you can see, if I, uh, Zoom these up so you can see them. Uh, underexposed, a medium exposure, an overexposure. And that's so that all three can be put together in what's called HDR or high dynamic range. So I'm just going to select all three. Right click, photo merge, HDR, or just simply hit Control H from your keyboard. That will bring up this dialog box. It will start to generate a preview of those three images. And it will show you if it puts those three images together, that's what they'll look like. So a couple of things in here before we just click merge uh, is that number one, it defaults to auto settings. So that means that it will automatically auto tone your photo. So it'll apply settings, move some of the sliders for you. If you don't want that, turn it off and then you're starting from scratch and you can build it yourself. But I do like the auto setting as a good starting point. 
The next thing is that if there was some movement in your photo, like if there was a flag waving, or in this case, I do have some birds flying around, uh, you can turn on the ghost. And what that will do is it'll generate a new preview. And if there was anything moving around in the photo, it will lock on to one of the three exposures to freeze the movement. It'll still use all three, but it'll use one to freeze the frame. And then um, it'll build, continue to build the HDR. And so for example, the water was moving. So there's some red here letting me know, because I turned on the overlay, hey, the water was moving in that spot. Hey, the trees were blowing in the wind in this spot. The birds might have a little red on them too because they were moving around as well. So it just freezes that motion so that you don't have spots that are maybe out of focus or blurry or duplicated because things were moving in the photo. So with that said, I'm just going to go ahead and merge. This is and has always been a background process. So anything happening up here in the upper left corner happens in the background. So that means you can keep working. You don't have to wait for it. I can go ahead and start working on the next photo, do whatever I want, and it will just continue to process and build that HDR in the background. Um, someone asked earlier, I forgot who it was. Let's see here. James Howe was asking, is this gonna be Lightroom CC or Lightroom Classic CC? This is one of the reasons why I'm doing this in Lightroom Classic CC because Lightroom CC doesn't have merge HDR and merge panorama at this point. So if I wanna do those features, I have to do it in Classic or Photoshop. Uh, so with that said, here's the new HDR that it created. Um, I can go ahead and just collapse the stack of the other ones. I can also add this one to the stack. But here's the new one that it created of all three. So I'm going to take it into the develop module because HDRs are usually never done when you just click HDR or the photo isn't done just because you made the HDR. There's probably other things you want to do. And there are definitely other things I want to do in this photo. So uh, where do I start? So people always ask that question. I usually make sure my lens corrections are enabled. Uh, that's where I usually start. By doing that, you notice that the image didn't really change a lot, but it got a lot, it got a little lighter along the edges. That's because in this particular lens, there's a little bit of vignetting that this automatically removes. Also, if you've seen those green halos around parts of your image, then you want to remove the chromatic aberration. Just one checkbox and it should remove that uh, ghosting or that halo that sometimes you'll get depending on the lighting uh, with chromatic aberration. All right, so I got that done. Um, I know that my lens has been corrected. I know the vignetting has been taken care of. The next thing I go to do is I set my profile. In other words, I set a starting profile. So this, was, this could be considered a landscape image. It could be considered Adobe Standard, which is kind of flat. Um, I usually like Adobe Vivid. I like vivid colors in my photos, so I start there. And again, this is not a, you're finished. This is a, this is a starting point. So I'm picking starting points at this point. Now I will go in and fine tune them. All right, so with that said, um, Duck Spot, Duck Spat, you're welcome uh, for the stream. And let me make sure I got my Facebook folks up here as well to make sure that I'm not missing any good Facebook comments. Ooh, lots of, lots of hellos. Hello, everyone on Facebook as well. Hey, Faith, what's going on? All right, Manuela. All right, so with that said, the next thing I go to do before I start messing with sliders, I got to make sure my photo's straight. And especially if it's a landscape, one of the things that will drive, like it's like uh, nails, fingernails on a chalkboard is when I see a crooked horizon line. Now, this one is slightly crooked. I might not have screamed too much when I saw this, but I... It's the first thing I look for, I can tell. And to straighten that out, you can use your crop. You can just go ahead, you get some, you get a grid here. You can just go ahead and start rotating and the grid gets better. Uh, but I don't like doing it that way. Let me escape out of that. I like knowing that it's straight. I don't want to eyeball it against the grid. I don't want to, you know, miss it or maybe I don't get it just right. So what I'll do instead is I'll use the angle tool. You'll find this in Photoshop as well. And the angle tool simply says, hey, what should be straight? You just drag it along the line that should be straight. And if it's crooked, it'll straighten it out. So it tilted it just slightly to the left because that line wasn't perfectly straight. Now it is. 
All right, so with that said, and welcome uh, Yusuf from Dubai, all the way from Dubai, a place I've always wanted to go. I'll get there someday. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get out of crop. All right, what's next? So we, we put together the three uh, bracketed exposures for an HDR. We took care of the lens correction. We get it, gave it a good starting profile. Now what? Are, is, am I done? Well, the are you done question is really up to you. It's when you have decided that you're finished with this photo. Am I done? No, I'm not finished. So even though the auto toning or setting gave it some adjustments, I rarely agree 100% with those adjustments. The auto tone does a good job of getting me most of the way there, but I'm probably going to tweak a few things. No, not probably. I'm always going to tweak a few things to get it just the way I want. So first of all, I've noticed that auto tone tends to de like make it less contrasty. So it, it always takes the contrast down, and I always take the contrast either to zero or up. I don't want less contrast. I want either zero or more contrast. So that's one thing I always argue with it on. Um, and since it's my photo, I decide. So next thing is the shadows. Now on a portrait, shadows are probably too high and when it automatically adjusts them. But on a landscape, I actually like where it is. I usually even get a, give it a little bit more just to see what I can bring out. So all of this dark area in the bottom left here and along the horizon, uh, that's all shadow area. So let's see if I can bring that out a little bit more. And if I take it all the way over, it's, it'll probably start to wash out the photo, but look, all those trees on the left-hand side came in. So you just have to decide how far to go with that. I'm just gonna go a little further and see if that's where I want it to be. Now you can always take the exposure up higher and see all that stuff, but again, then you're gonna pretty much mess up the rest of the photo. So work with shadows. And if I really wanted to bring that out some more, and bring this out some more, but not mess with the rest, then I might use an adjustment brush and just adjust the adjustment brush for the shadows or the exposure and paint in the area that I want it to be brighter. But I'm actually okay with where it is. The next thing is that there's probably some noise in this photo because this was take, oh, actually this one probably is okay. Uh, I do have one coming up that's gonna have some noise in it because it was taken with the drone and the drone um, is not going to sit still long enough in one spot to give me 100 ISO and no noise. So it's probably going to have some noise in it. This was DSLR, so this one's okay. This one was shot on a tripod. All right, next one. It also desaturated the photo a little bit. Uh, again, I'm going to either want that on zero or even a little higher. Not that high. That's too high. If it starts to make your eyes hurt. You probably have gone too far. So let's pull back. Pull back, pull back, pull back, pull back. Uh, maybe a plus three or four will probably do it for me. Um, now, the sky wasn't too bad. It was actually, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't great. It wasn't a perfect sky, but it was also not a horrible sky either. So I might want to apply just a little bit of dehaze just to get rid of some of that morning haze that would be in the sky. Again, don't go too far. It looks like it's going to be great, but trust me, there will be areas in the photo that aren't great. So don't go too far, uh, even though you might be tempted to because you'll end up messing up areas that, that were good now that they won't be. Okay, um, now let's say I did want to bring out some more of that dehaze in the sky, but I don't want to do anything else. Again, you can use an adjustment brush or you can use the graduated filter or linear filter. So if I pull down a linear filter, well, first of all, before I even pull it down, I'll set a preset for what I want it to do. I want it to dehaze. Why the preset? Because if you don't do the preset, you're gonna have to manually adjust all the sliders. And if they've been moved, you're gonna have to manually put them all back to zero. What choosing a preset does is says, dehaze has now been adjusted, Everything else has been set to zero, so you don't have to think about it. So if I pull this down, and let's say I go to there, and then I go in and I say, oh, well, that's a little more dehaze, but maybe I want a little more. And maybe something like right about there, not too far. But of course, it's, start, it's gonna start dehazing the lighthouse and everything else that I might not want. So luckily, there is a brush option 
And if I go into the brush option, I can go in and I can Nope, I want to do that. I want to auto mask and I want to erase. There we go. Uh, actually, erase. So erase says take that effect off of the area that I'm painting on. So for example, if I bring up my tablet here, I can go in and say, don't dehaze the lighthouse any more than I already did with this graduated filter. Just take it off this area. All right. There we go. So I get dehaze in the sky, but I don't get it on the things I don't want it on. And maybe I don't want it down here either. So I'll take it off this area here. So that's selective dehaze. All right. Okay. And again, that's all non-destructive. You can always come back if you missed a spot. If you didn't get it just right, you can always come back and do more. All right. So with that said, now that I've got that taken care of, am I done? Then what I start to look at at this point is overall ton tonality looks good. I like the feel of the photo. Um, maybe I could use some sharpening. I'll do that at the end if I didn't already do it at the beginning. And now I start to look for distracting objects. Like, for example, I'll just start thinking to myself, like, well, what's this sticking out from the side? What, what are these towers? Do they make or break the photo? If I took them away, would anyone care? So I start looking like, uh, okay, those are birds, but wait, there's a UFO up there. Oh, that's a drone. And that's a copy of the drone because it was an HDR. So those are the kinds of things. Or maybe that's not a copy. Maybe that is a bird. But that looks weird. So I take that one out. I take this one out. So when you start to get to that point to where what's distracting from the photo, then you might want to start doing things to alleviate that. Now, the question is whether you want to do that in Photoshop or Lightroom. In Lightroom, getting rid of the drone, easy. All I'd have to do is go to the Spot Removal tool and either just click or drag and boom, done, gone. Gone non-destructively. I could always bring it back. Uh, there's a little line of something there. Take that out as well. Oh, sorry. Making my brush size smaller. Let's move the photo up. But then when I get here, down to this thing, this part sticking out, um, that might be tricky to get rid of. So let me show you why. If I start painting that out, when I say tricky to get rid of, tricky in Lightroom, because Lightroom's spot removal tool slash healing brush is not the real deal. It's not the one in Photoshop. So I could mess with that. I could probably get that to work, probably move that around. But see then, you know, in other words, it starts becoming an issue of, is this worth the time? Like, it's not perfect. So let's undo that one. And let's see if we can just get rid of it, delete it. There we go. And uh, let's, let's go into Photoshop and take care of that the right way. So let's go get out of this. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to click again. Let's get out of that tool. There we go. Go down and um, let's say that I want to just do all the rest of my spot removal in Photoshop. All right, so I'm going to, I could hit Command E or I could right click on the photo and say Edit in Photoshop. Either one's going to take me over there. PC, of course, Control E. And I see Photoshop coming up to the front, which means it's loading this raw, a copy, the raw file. Uh, not, it's not going to let me save over the original. So I, that's why I didn't get a dialog box because it's raw. It will automatically bring over a copy and it brought over a copy with my edits. So I don't have to start from scratch. So first and foremost, now I'm seeing one way up here. What is this? I don't know. It could be probably a bird, but like that's just distracting. So let's go ahead and start removing some of the stuff that really is not adding anything to the photo. Yes, it was really there, but no, <laughs> it doesn't need to be there in my finished image. So that was done with the spot healing brush in Photoshop, which is way more accurate. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. And the same thing, we're, and smaller is better. So smaller brush size. And we're going to do the same thing. Now, if this doesn't work, then I'll use the patch tool. But let me see if I can do it with the spot removal or the healing brush first. If I can get a good edge, I'll do it. If not... I was, eh, 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 it's okay. So I just fixed that with a clone stamp just to finish it off. 
Some of you would say, hey, how come you didn't duplicate the layer? How come you're not working in the layers? How come, you know, what if you mess up? What if you need to go back? Well, remember, I still have the original. That's my duplicate. Uh, I don't duplicate it in Photoshop because then that's a duplicate of a duplicate. I don't need two duplicates. I have the original in Lightroom. So if I mess up and need to go back and start from scratch, I can't. If you want duplicate layers, by all means, do duplicate layers. This is not a you have to do it my way. I'm just explaining why I don't do it. So now, again, the towers over there on the right-hand side. Do I need them? They, yeah, they're technically there. They're part of the landscape, but they don't really add anything to the photo. That's what you're really deciding. Uh, it's your photo, so you decide whether or not these cell towers <laughs> are important to you. And if not, then you can go ahead and remove them. It's your photo. So I'm going to go ahead and say that the cell towers, in my case, are not relevant. They don't mean anything. They're not helping me with the photo at all. They're just making you look over there and say, huh, wonder what those towers are. And now you don't have to say that anymore. All right, let's go look at my birds. I think my birds were pretty good. Those look good. I think these are okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Those are okay. There's one more up here. Yeah, the UFO up here could probably go. Um, so once again, we'll get rid of the UFO. All right. Okay. I think I got rid of all the things. Now I could be start to really be picky and say, well, do I need this tower or whatever this light post is over here? Maybe I, maybe I don't care about the one that's in the trees, but I do care about the part of it that's sticking up. So in that case, I will use the patch tool instead so I can grab the part of it that I want, like so. Switch to content aware patch and just take it away and it'll just take it away. So again, now you knew you would never know that's missing, but, and the rest of the pole is fine because it's just lighting up the sidewalk. So again, this is all you. This is you deciding what's important, what's distracting, what's not. Take away what you don't like, what you do, you keep what you do like. You know, ad lib if you want. So if I wanted more clouds, I could say, for example, um, let's see. Make a selection here. All right. And Command J. And free transform. Or actually, now we're going to do a free transform. Scale that down a bit. Move that up a bit. There we go. So you just start getting into, whoa, what else do I want to, how, how else do I want to enhance the photo? I've got a nice light up here. Now I am going to duplicate the layer because I want to experiment with that light. So I'm going to pull down a bit and we're going to go to filter, convert for smart filter so I can always change it if I choose to change my mind later. And once that converts this into a smart object, I will be able to go in and try and experiment. Let's go to filter and let's go to render and let's go to lens flare. And I can now pick up the fake lens flare and put it where I want. Whoa, that's way too bright. Let's pull it down. Not so bright. And you can experiment with the different types. Do you find one you like? Ooh, I kind of like that one actually. Maybe not so bright. Click OK. And it will render that. Ooh, we just lit that light up a little bit more. All right. So again, that's a smart filter layer. So I can always turn that off. Turn Ooh, we can make it blink. Make it blinky. All right. Turn that off. Turn it on. Play with it to your heart's content. And because that is on a separate layer, I can always decide to come back and turn that off or get rid of it. All right. So at this point, I'm done with the kinds of things I want to do in Photoshop because we got other photos to play with. So let's save this one. Now it's gonna take a little bit longer. It's a 45 or 48 megapixel image with multiple layers now. So it'll take a moment or two to save that. And it will place it right alongside the original one, uh, the original raw file inside of uh, Lightroom Classic or Lightroom CC. So if you had done the edit from Lightroom CC, it would do the same thing. It would make a layer TIFF in that case. Close it, switch back to um, Lightroom, 
and your edit it one is there right alongside your original HDR. So I tend to like to save mine as PSDs, which is a preference. If not, it would be a layer TIFF file. All right, so we got that one out of the way. The next one I wanna do, and this is like so much fun. It's like, I think I wanna have more fun with, let's do the, we did the lighthouse already. Let's do another one. We'll do, we'll do another lighthouse in a minute. I want to do this Renaissance Center one. This is the Renaissance Center in downtown Detroit, taken from the, just turning around from the lighthouse and taking the other direction. And same thing, I made an HDR, or made a bracketed exposure so I can make an HDR. C Control H to bring up the uh, HDR merge feature. And... Uh, friend Sam, um... That's really helpful. Thanks. Jay's asking what computer I'm using. Jay, I'm using a 27-inch iMac uh, latest model. Uh, do you think HDR makes the picture unnatural? Yeah, if you take it too far. Uh, HDR used properly is just simply combining dark and light exposures to get the proper exposure that your eye saw. But if you adjust it too far, then yeah, you can take it too far. So like this is an HDR. This is not taking things too far. This is just what the image looked like from my eye. All right, so I see a lot of red there because the trees were moving. That's okay. We're going to go ahead and merge it, and I see lots of things I want to do to this photo, so it's going to be fun. All right, that will merge our HDR. Again, it's doing that in the background, so I can keep going. I could say, you know, grab three more and merge those or start working on a different photo. So just keep that in mind that whatever's happening up here is always happening in the background. You don't have to wait for it, unless you're waiting for it <laughs> to show people. Uh, but otherwise, you can keep working while whatever's going on up there is going on. Okay, so here's the finished version of that one. Uh, well, I should say the HDR version of that one. Let's go into the develop module. We're going to do the same kinds of things. So first, we'll go into our lens correction. Did I not get a preview of that? Here, let's do that again. That's weird. Why am I not getting a preview of this? It's there. It's there. It doesn't want us to edit this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Turn, there we go. <laughs> Turn on the lens profile. And next thing I want to do is notice the whole thing's leaning to the right. Now, I showed you how to fix the horizon. What if you got buildings leaning? And this is not a this is not an upright thing. It's not like they're caving in on each other. This photo is just crooked. So same technique. Uh, grab your crop tool. Grab your angle tool. The angle tool is not just for left to right. It's also up and down. So I can go and say, hey, this should be straight. And it'll straighten the whole photo. So just keep that in mind. Anytime you got something that's not straight, that will straighten it for you. All right, next thing, um, same thing. We'll, we'll pick our uh, starting point for our um, profile. And then, again, sliders that are not where I want them to be. Like, I don't want less contrast. I usually want more. I want a little bit more dehay. Oh, wait, don't go too far. You get crazy. Let's go maybe about there. Vibrance looks okay. Everything else looks okay about this photo. I don't need to really take it that far, but because it is a building, I can give it more clarity because that won't necessarily hurt it unless I go too far. And now, maybe I did go too far on one of these. Hold on. Bring the clarity back down a little bit because I'm looking down here and it's starting to look a little bunchy, a little funky down there. Pull that back just a little. Okay. The next thing I want to do is get rid of my distracting objects, like this building here. What is that? Uh, that serves no purpose in my photo. This light running into the tree, that kind of serves no purpose in my photo. So, sounds like a trip to Photoshop to me, so Command E. Because that would take just way too long to try and do it with the spot removal tool in Lightroom. All right, so now I'm in Photoshop and we can do this in stages. Or you can do it all, you can try and do it all at once. I like to work in stages when it's multiple things like this building and its little tower here, whatever this is. So I'll take out this little antenna first. Good. Take out this part of the building next. Good. Take out and let's make a brush a little bit bigger. And now I could probably get the rest of this all in one. 
So don't always think you have to do it all in one stage. You can work in pieces. Good. Oh, left a piece. There we go. Now, this light, um, same thing. It's serving no purpose. Just making you look at it instead of the Renaissance Center. So maybe I'll take the pole out. Like that. That works pretty good. And then maybe I'll start to take out the individual pieces of the light. And again, it's picking up from the spaces next to it, which is fine in most cases, except when it's not. All right. Ooh, that last one was unnecessary. Okay. Distracting elements removed. The rocks are okay. I don't know what this is on the rock. I don't know if I made it worse. There we go. That's better. Save it. Again, um, I don't need a layer for this because I have the original. Come back. And, and you, like, if I were really being picky, I might even get rid of the little antennas on top of the building. But they're there. They're supposed to be there. Again, they're not that distracting. Switch back to uh, Lightroom. And there it is next to the original. So there's my edited one versus here's the one we started with. And here's the one we just did. And that tree, now that I can tell that the pole was there, I can see it. I might go back in and take care of that some more, just uh, blend that in some more. But again, the average person is not going to notice it because they won't know the pole was there. All right, next. Uh, that was fun, fun, fun. And we got another pole here. I'm just going to go in and show you what I mean by that. Here, I'll just open it. Again, here's, here's where your decision goes in. I love the light, Alice. I love the scene. I need to process it. But that pole on the left is really distracting. So I could do one of two things. I could just simply crop it. That'd be the easy way out and recompose the photo. And that would be an okay photo. But if I needed that much area of the photo and I didn't want to, oops, didn't want to lose it, then I need to take that part out. So we'll go in and same thing piece by piece rather than try and doing all of this at once. Maybe that much of it first. Maybe that much of it next. And then the rest of it. And then fixing anything that needs to be fixed. Taking any remnants away from it. Then I've also got this little green lens flare in the water. It's more distracting than it is complimentary. And away we go, save, it'll put it right next to the original. Close it, switch back, and there it is. So one without, one with the pole. Now, without the pole, now I can go in and finish processing. Now, this one was taken, I think, hold on, let's see. If we go to lens correction, we'll see in a minute. Ah, when it says none, then I know that this one was actually taken with my drone because my drone's a newer drone. It's the Mavic Air. And the Mavic Air doesn't have a profile yet in, in Lightroom. The Mavic Pro does. And the Mavic Pro and the Mavic Air cameras are very similar. So I, what I would do is just simply do it manually. DJI, not the Inspire, but the Mavic Pro. And you can even see it start to affect the image. It's a little thing, especially on that left edge. See what the left and right edges are doing? But it's correcting that bending that you'll get sometimes from the lens. And so even if it doesn't auto detect, if you know what you shot it with, you can go in and change it yourself. Uh, are there any adjustments that must be done in Lightroom because it's not available in Photoshop? Are there any adjustments that must be done in Lightroom because they're not available in Photoshop? No, because you have Camera Raw in Photoshop, which is pretty much everything that Lightroom does. So you could do it all in Lightroom. I'm sorry, you could do it all in Photoshop. Um, but you can't manage your photos really in Photoshop. So I prefer to do as much as I can non-destructively in Lightroom and then only go to Photoshop if I have to. So, because in a lot of cases, especially with landscape and travel, I don't have to go to Photoshop for most things. 
Uh, all right, so we got that. Now, this particular one does not give me a raw profile to choose from, but it does give me all the artistic ones. So I might get a little fancy on this one. And let's say I want to go with the artistic red. The thing I like about the all the profiles is that you have an amount slider, so you can get more or less of that amount of whatever you're choosing. You've got some um, black and white ones, of course, to pick from. These are pretty cool. And again, all of these are non-destructive and can be picked and repicked at any time, and they don't affect the sliders. So even if you've made other adjustments, uh, this will not affect or impact your other adjustments other than visually what it's doing to the photo. But it won't move the sliders, in other words. So many. I think I like that one, actually. Now let's crank it up a little bit more. All right. Close that. Next thing I'll do on this one is I will auto tone it from here. Ooh, no. Ah, gross. Yuck. Okay. <laughs> Contrast up. Shadows in this case, not so much. Don't do that much to them. And clarity and a little dehaze. I might go a little crazier on the dehaze on this one. And this is the one I think, yeah, this one's got a little noise in it because that was shot with a drone. And so therefore, I'm going to go into detail and apply a little noise reduction to it as well. And of course, you can always sharpen here or in Photoshop. All right. Cool, cool, cool. I'm liking where this is going. Now, you can, of course, always add things to the photo. So for example, if I wanted to add, this one doesn't really need one, but let's say I want to add a spotlight. I can go to my radio filter, switch it to exposure. Just again, defaults everything else to zero and only affects the exposure. And then I could go in and say, hey, I want to highlight, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Hey, I want to highlight, let's invert it first. Now, here we go. I want to highlight these rocks. Just want to put some little cast, little beams of light on the rock there. Um, so I can move that around. I can light up anything I want as I move it around. So I just want this to stand out a little bit more. Maybe in that shape, and maybe in that. Just adding, just a touch of light down in that spot. All right. So with that said, what are we doing here? There we go. So with that said, um, we could keep doing this all day, but I think you get the idea. So those are just a few things I would do to my travel photos. Um, just remember, get rid of distracting objects, no crooked horizon lines. Um, it's okay to adjust for exposure and contrast and all of those things, but just, again, don't overdo it. Zoom in, check for artifacts, check for halos and things, because a lot of the sliders, when you push them too far, will introduce a slight glow around your object, and that lets you know you've gone too far. Um, don't forget about the adjustment brush where you want to tweak things or the radio filters, graduated filters where you want to tweak things in certain spots. And just a quick recap for those who just got here, I'll show you a, finish, a few of the finished ones. That's a finished one. Well, finished so far, I should say. Finished for the stream. Here's another finished one for the stream. And here's another finished one for the stream. So those are a few that we worked on thus far and hope you got something out of this and hope you learned something. What tablet am I using? This is a Wacom Cintiq 27 QHD. All right, and with that said, thanks everyone for joining me. And we are way over time from a Facebook standpoint, but for my YouTube folks and Twitter folks, hopefully you will stick around and watch more. So with that said, thanks everybody. Catch you on the next one. Bye. And when I say bye, it takes me like five minutes to stop this. So bye.